heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with an abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain you, to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The, be the beast which you saw once was, now is, not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go into its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not writ been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast, because it was once, once was, now it is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw were, are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitude, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. By agreeing to hand over the beast and their royal authority. Until God's word words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. May uh, God add his blessing to this word and this message. Whew. You know, all this talk of revelation and end times and, and judgment and victory in Christ has kind of made me do uh, some thinking. Uh, some considerable thinking about the hereafter. Any, anybody else ever been there, you know, thinking about Revelation at times? We start to think about the hereafter a little bit. And, and for me, a lot of that is, I, I, I walk into a room and I wonder, what am I here after? <laughs> right? Anybody else relate to that? You know, we, uh, we are a people who get easily distracted, aren't we? In fact, I would wager that some of you, you start today, and as you start today, you have a picture, this is what I want to get done today, and you find yourself at the end of the day with all these things that you've gotten done except for the one thing that you wanted to get done. Anybody else ever been there? Not just me, is it? We get easily distracted. And many times it's something that's trivial, it really doesn't matter, it's not the end of the world. You know, thinking of Revelation, right? Uh, and, and it's something that, that can wait till the next day, and it will probably be just fine many times. But what I wonder is, what about those times that God speaks to your heart? You've been reading the scriptures, you, you go to a conference, you hear a sermon, uh, maybe just, just out of the blue. God speaks to your heart. He lays a conviction upon your heart. You know, whether it's about your prayer time, your study time, whether it's about connection to church, using your gifts, perhaps it's about uh, how, uh, how you give to the work of God. He lays something on your heart, and then life happens, and you forget. You get distracted. And then down the road, maybe you're, you're in the scriptures again, and you're talking with someone, or you're back at church, you hear some, a sermon or whatever, and, and, and it kind of comes back again, and you're like, Oh, yeah, I remember God had actually spoken that to me days ago, months ago, years ago. Maybe it keeps coming back, and, 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 but you just got distracted. And so you really never followed through on what God had said to you. You know, isn't it interesting? So often we, we pray for God to reveal his will to us, and we ask God to show us the way. 
and, and so often there's things that God has already shown us, revealed to us, spoken to us about, and we still haven't been obedient on those things. It's not that we're wanting to. Sometimes we just get distracted. You guys ever get busy? Life happens. Things fall on your plate. Unexpected phone calls. Things happen. We get distracted. So, so as we come in at Revelation chapter 17, John, John sees another vision of an angel who says in verse 1, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. And, and, and for me, that raises a, a couple of questions real quickly. One is, who is this great prostitute? And two is, how do I make sure to completely avoid her? Because, you know, she's going down. And I don't want to be part of going down with her, right? So who is she, and, and how do I avoid her? But rather than starting with this punishment, the angel says, I will show you this punishment, and rather than starting with the punishment about to happen on the great prostitute, the angel instead begins with the description of her in verses 2 through 6. And he says, with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery with the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. And then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And this title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. And listen to this next line. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Some translations say, I marvel. Now John has a really good memory. The only problem is, it's short. Maybe you can relate to that as well. The angel says, I'm going to show you her punishment in verse 1. And then by the time we get to verse 6, John is astonished and he's marveling at this woman. Talk about someone who's easily distracted because the phrase that's used there, it, it, it has a sense of he, he's marveling and he's astonished, not only in the sense of, of how grand she is, maybe how evil she is, but also there's this, this attraction that he has. This attraction, he's wondering, he's marveling at who this, this woman is. And, and, and I think there's this sadistic irony in knowing that something is wrong on the one hand, and yet, on the other hand, there's something in us that oddly wants it. Have you been there before? I, I know I shouldn't. I know in the end I'm going to regret it. But for now, in this moment, I want it and I don't care. <coughs> You know, I want to give kudos to all the kids who are willing to wait, right? Because in our culture, that's not where people are at. In our culture, we think about immediate gratification. We think about the pleasure we can have in this moment. And the one thing that we often don't do in our culture is think about where these choices are going to take us down the road. Because we get distracted at the end. We just want the now, don't we? And, and you know what they call that? Uh, when when uh, uh, we get this idea of, I know I shouldn't, I know the evil, I know where it's going to take me, I, I know it's a place I don't want to go, but in this moment I don't care. What we call that is immaturity. We probably could throw down another word or two too, but we'll stick with that one today. We'll call it immaturity, and unfortunately, many people never grow out of it. We get distracted from the things that really matter uh, to the things that are passing away. We get distracted from the things of God to things that really don't matter. But they kind of attract us and they kind of allure us in. And so the scriptures talk to us about fleeing temptation and pursuing righteousness. And you know, I think we need the two together. It's not just enough to flee temptation because you know what we'll end up doing? If we end up fleeing temptation, we'll just do a little circle we'll come right back around. <laughs> won't we? Unless we have our eyes on the prize. Pursuing the righteousness. Pursuing Christ 
He'll keep us going in the right direction. So who is, who is this woman? And what is it about her that attracts people, that astonishes them and marvels them? Even the people, uh, even alluring those who know that her end is coming. And, and the text gives us a variety of clues. So first, we encounter this woman, and it says in verse 1, that she sits on many waters. Now, conveniently for us, in Revelation chapter, or verse 15, it tells us what the waters are. In verse 15, uh, it says, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So once again, we know that we're talking in symbolic language in the book of Revelation. Convenient for us, he actually tells us what the waters are in verse 15 as peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So we know that this woman is not a literal person, right? But she is a political kingdom. In fact, at the very end of the text, it says, The woman that you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Uh, sitting upon many waters was also a phrase that was used to speak of a specific Old Testament kingdom, uh, a kingdom that was involved in all sorts of idolatry that had, had come in and conquered Jerusalem and the people of Israel and, and taken them into captivity and into exile. It happened to be a kingdom that was sitting on the Euphrates River and a kingdom that was noted for its irrigation and its transportation canals. Uh, it was also a kingdom that and Jeremiah is said to have sat upon many waters. And it's a kingdom that shows up several times in the book of Revelation. Anybody know what that kingdom is? Babylon. Babylon. In fact, if you look ahead, you probably have the next title for chapter 18 that says, The Fall of Babylon. Babylon. The king, uh, the icing comes also in verse 5, where it says, This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Uh, and, and the time of Rome, one of the things that the prostitutes often had was uh, on their foreheads, they wore their name on their forehead. So the woman that we see here in chapter 17 is very clearly a symbol of Babylon. Very clearly a symbol of Babylon. The question is, is what is Babylon a symbol of? And, and some say, uh, so scholars differ, you know, surprise, surprise, right? Not everybody agrees on Revelation. Uh, some scholars say that Babylon is a picture of Jerusalem, unfaithful Jerusalem. And, and they'll go back to chapter 11, verse 8, where it talks about the great city of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, and it equips it to Sodom and Egypt. And, and they'll look at the argument of, of the woman here is sitting on the beast. And so the argument goes like this, well, if the beast is Rome, then the woman must be Jerusalem because it has to be differentiated, because the woman's sitting on the beast. Now, some scholars don't make that distinction, and, and some do. Uh, but the ones who say it's Jerusalem, they look at the fact that throughout the scriptures, adultery is equated to what? Idolatry. Idolatry. Spiritual adultery. Idolatry, placing anything before God, he, he uses it, metaphorically speaking, of adultery of God's people being unfaithful to God. And so they say it's Jerusalem. It's a picture of God's people being unfaithful to God. Now, we don't have to just talk about Jerusalem with that, do we? We can talk about Christians. We can talk about God's people being unfaithful to God. When well, we talk about people who are Christian in name only, can't we? So that's where some scholars go. Some scholars say that Babylon is still a picture of Rome. And while Rome is not built on, on the waters like Babylon was, in verse 15 it describes the waters as the people, nations, and languages. And, and, and Rome definitely had dominion over the peoples, the nations, and the languages. And Rome definitely is filled with idolatry. And so they'd still look at the woman here as a, a picture of Rome. And then they have another interpretation is that Rome is about a first century representation of Babylon. And that the power of the symbolism is that it makes it applicable at any age. So we can talk about kingdoms of, of Rome in the first century. We can talk about another kingdom in a different age. Uh, but, but they look at this as a sense of, of how our culture is pulling us away from the one true God. 
and, and the symbolic language. Now, in my opinion, identifying who the woman is really isn't the biggest deal here. Because she's clearly symbolic, and, and the picture clearly makes it applicable uh, during different stages of history. So in my opinion, who she is may not be as important as answering what is it that makes her so attractive. And why is it that when we know that her end is punishment, that her end is judgment, that in the end it's not anything good, what is it that makes her so attractive? Whether we're talking about Babylon in the Old Testament, or whether we're talking about Rome in the first century, or, dare we say it, if we're talking about America today, or any culture for that matter, that pulls us away from God. And I think as we look at this woman, what we see is a picture of what the world offers to us in the place of God. And what we find in this woman is, is one who offers to us an attractive counterfeit to finding true meaning and true purpose in the one who has created us, in God alone. And what this woman does is she kind of seduces and she kind of steals our love away from God. And, and it's not a matter of uh, all the time. It's not a matter of all the time. Well, I'm going to choose to go somewhere else besides God. It's a matter of something that's drawing our hearts away. And it can be little by little by little, but just drawing our hearts away. To all of a sudden, we find that we've drifted away from God, and we found ourselves more of a worldly mindset and a worldly perspective, and living in a worldly way. In verse 2, it talks about how the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. And, and as I said before, adultery is, is pretty much a picture of idolatry. And it's not because we necessarily want to put something in the place of God, but it says we're intoxicated, or the kings of the earth and the inhabitants are intoxicated by the wine of her adulteries, even knowing that they're passing away. And you might notice that where the leaders go, the people will follow. We have the kings and then the inhabitants. You can think about it in terms of our, our, uh, our problem with role models in our culture, right? People always pick the, the wrong role models, it seems like. And they look at all the celebrities that, that go down a bad path, and what do we do? We've got to mimic their fads. We've got to dress like they do. We've got to follow them on Twitter and Facebook and all these other things. And, but, uh, but we look at these people who who set a great for example, don't they? Our culture does. They're, in fa they're fascinated by them, and they're infatuated with them. But if you notice, it says they're intoxicated. And, and intoxicated, I don't know about you, but it brings certain images to my mind that may not be so appealing. But when you think about intoxicated, another meaning of intoxicated is they're exhilarated by, they're excited by. And what I want you to think about for a moment you know, idolatry is anything that we put before God. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It could be a good thing in the wrong order. A good thing in the wrong place. They were intoxicated by her adulteries. Think about how we get intoxicated by our culture. About all the things that just start to attract us and, and pull us in. Not necessarily bad things. But good things put before God. And, and, and you know, when I think about that, some, some of us, we get intoxicated by sports, don't we? Look at, look at the craze in our culture about sports. In fact, I, I can't remember who it was or whether we read it somewhere. They said that one of the, the religion of the uh, next century was going to be sports. Remember that? Maybe it was a conference we went to. And, and uh, they said that that will literally replace religion. And think about what sports is doing in our culture today. About the, the money that gets poured into it, the enthusiasm that gets poured into it, the passion, the time, the energy that gets poured into sports. In fact, I remember we had a, a, a family come to church one time. They're not here, so I can tell the story, right? I want to make it the nature. But, but they literally came a couple Sundays and they said, uh, we won't see you for the whole next season because we'll be doing hockey every week. Do I have anything against hockey? I don't have anything against hockey. I don't have anything against sports. So if we have an attitude that says, you know, I'm going to push God aside for this sport. I'm going to push God aside for this activity. I'm going to push God aside for this want, this desire. That's idolatry according to scripture. 
And, and, and you know, it could be, for some, it could be the bigger paycheck. You know, my whole life is consumed by, by another paycheck, climbing the corporate ladder, and, and so I push aside the things of God so that I can succeed in the business world. I don't have anything against succeeding in the business world. But if it comes at the expense of our faith, if it comes at the compromising of our faith, then we have a donkey. For some, it could be a healthy lifestyle. We just kind of get consumed with, with being healthy, right? Whether it's working out, whether it's diet, you know, whether it's getting into this bad, that, that, whatever. If it comes in the place of God, that's idolatry. But we get intoxicated by things like that, don't we? We get intoxicated because in many respects, what we look at with some of these things is we're looking at the immediate. We're looking at the pleasure that it brings us right now, the enjoyment that we get right now. We don't look down the road. We don't look about how it's going to affect us spiritually. We don't think about how it's going to affect our walk with God in the long term. We can just think about how much fun it is to get out. I'm going to pick on you now, Keith. Is that okay? How much fun it is to get out on that motorcycle and just go for a ride. Do I have anything against motorcycles? No. But anything we can put we put before God takes that place. That's exactly what he's talking about with the adultery. You know, you, when we talk about adultery, you know, we have an image in our mind that's kind of a, uh, certainly a, a bad connotation. But when we start thinking about it in the sense of idolatry and how we can even put good things before God, because that's what we see with this woman. We see some bad things with her, with the abominations. But there's this attractiveness to her, this pleasure that she brings right now. And people are intoxicated because they're looking at, what can she give me right now? What pleasure, what experience, what power, what influence can she give me right now? And, and even though John knows that these things are passing away, and even though we know that we will be judged for idolatry, yet there's something that kind of distracts us and pulls us in that direction. Because when we think about the world, why it's so attractive, it's because it offers us idols that we can see and we can touch and we experience the pleasure right now, whereas our faith worships and serves the God who's yet unseen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen, right? So in verse 2, we see the kings and the inhabitants, they're intoxicated with her, so we can think about, well, they're appealing to our desire, they're appealing to that sense of being somebody and wanting to fit in. How many of you want to walk into a room, look around and think, I'm missing something that everybody else knows? Probably don't want to be there, do you? <clears throat> somebody starts to see your around and like, I feel like I'm, I'm missing out on something. We don't want to feel like we're missing out on anything, do we? Whether it's knowledge, whether it's an experience, isn't that part of how peer, peer pressure works? I want to feel accepted, but I also don't want to feel like I'm missing out on anything that all my friends are experiencing. I don't want to feel like I'm missing out on any of the toys that my friends have. Whether it's an iPhone, or a smartphone, or an iPad, right? <laughs> if my friends got it, I got it. I don't want to feel like I'm missing out. Well, there's that sense of that they're intoxicated. They have this sense of we want to fit in. In verse 3, we see that the woman is on the beast. There's a sense that there is a sense of, of power and persuasion and influence. We go through the description. She's dressed in purple and scarlet. Now, as I look around the room, I see lots of different colors. And we don't think anything of it. In fact, some of us would be like, man, I want some color in my life, right? But we go to the store and we just buy things. But, but in this day and age, those, those dyes that you're talking about, purple and scarlet, means wealth. These were expensive things. So we're talking about wealth when he talks about scarlet and when he talks about purple. And then he goes in and he talks about precious stones and pearls. And for having a golden cup, there's a sense of, of worldly success and wealth. Somebody who's not missing out on anything. So we see that picture. And who isn't attracted to it, right? Who isn't attracted to having the next best thing that comes out in the journalism? Now what we also see is her golden cup is filled with abominable things. There is a poison. There is a poison in getting drunk on, on materialism. Verse 6, we see drunk with the blood of the saints. Uh, you know, and so we have this picture in, in their day and age. It was certainly, it cost you something to follow Jesus. 
And people had to make a choice. Am I willing to pay the cost now of following Jesus, even if that cost is my life? Now for us in our culture, we don't quite have to pay that cost, but there is a cost to following Jesus. So the world is attractive because it offers these things now. Whether it's power, whether it's position, whether it's pleasure, it's a sense of not fitting in, uh, or the sense of fitting in, and it offers these things right here, right now, but the problem is, is, you know, the world doesn't tell you about the pain that comes later. Kind of that way with any addiction, isn't it? It doesn't tell you about the pain that comes. Now God says, hey, there may be a cost now, but he holds the promise of glory later. So John, John kind of marvels. He hears this description, and he, and he knows that punishment's coming, but yet, on the one hand, there's, there's still this astonishment and, and this marveling. Uh, and so we come to verse 6, and it talks about how he marvels. Then the angel says to John, he says, why are you astonished? Why are you astonished? Because let's think about it. Let's remember what's coming. Let's remember God. Let's remember what's on the other side. Why are you astonished? You know, the world is attractive. Otherwise, temptation wouldn't be strong. Right? Let's face it. If it wasn't, if it wasn't attractive, then we wouldn't have any wrestling with temptation, would we? Do you know the image that came to my mind? Fly paper is attractive to a fly until it gets stuck in it. it may not be deep, right? But maybe it will stick with you. That's the image that came to my mind. Fly paper is attractive to the fly until he gets stuck in it. That's the same picture that we have here. The woman may be attractive until you get stuck. Until you're part of her downfall, which is going to happen by the end and moving into the next chapter. So let's not get distracted. Because outward appearances can be very deceiving. And so the next verses in 7 through 14 kind of continues to develop how Rome is a, a first century version of this woman uh, and beast, which is, which is a pattern in many ways of, of anti-God empires that have, have existed uh, and will continue to exist throughout time till the very end of time. Do you believe that? There's going to be anti-God empires throughout time until we get to the very end of time. And, and scholars differ on, on uh, some of this, the aspects of the description. We have the seven kings. So there are some scholars who look at the seven kings. Uh, uh, well, the city set on seven hills. Uh, what city does that sound like to you? See, you guys are smart bunch, right? And so some will look at the city of seven hills, and they says also seven kings. So they're like looking at Rome, and they look at the seven kings, and they'll take and they'll start numbering the kings. Start numbering the kings, and they'll come to number six, who is the king who's in charge right now, and they'll say this is probably Nero. Now, they don't all agree on how to number the kings either, right? Imagine that, Christians who can't agree. But a very strong case for that. So they'll look at the seven kings and it talks about, you know, five have been, one is, and another's yet to come, right? And so they'll look at uh, the dating of Revelation and Nero. That's where some scholars are at when they look at the seven kings. Others look at the kings as, as pictures of seven kingdoms. Because if you go back and you look at all these anti-God empires throughout time through to this current time, you have Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Medo-Persia and then Greece and Rome, the one that now is, and then the final kingdom of the Antichrist. And so they can't look at it in that way. I think it's clear to us that there's always going to be an anti-God kingdom. And then we go into ten uh, kings, and, and scholars kind of differ on those two. Some scholars will say uh, that the ten kings are a picture of, uh, uh, of an empire that's going to come, kind of a, a new Rome. Uh, and you're going to have these ten different nation powers that are coming together to, to form this coalition against uh, God and, and God's people. Others say that the ten kings are symbolic because ten is a number of, of completion, of, of, of of having all together, of, of that completion all together. So they say it's a symbolic number of, of these worldly powers, however many they may be, coming against the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So, so they have differences of opinion on that. But here's what we all agree on. In verses 13 and 14, we see both their purpose and we also see uh, their defeat. 
They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Whether you take them as a little ten kingdoms, whether you take them as a symbolic ten kingdoms, I don't really care. I'm not going to fight you over that. What you see is a picture of the world coming against the Lamb. The world coming against God. And you see they're going to lose in the end. However attractive they may be now, in the end, it's God's world, and in the end, it's going to be God's way. And what we see as well is, is uh, in the last verses, how evil is going to turn on itself. Isn't it interesting that the beast turns against the woman? The world, the evil is going to turn in on itself. <laughs> Uh, we see that. We, we see that things that once perceived to bring pleasure are going to instead bring ruin. I guess that's kind of the nature of the beast, isn't it? And we see that God's purposes and God's words, they will be fulfilled. That's in verses 15 through 18. And that's a message that's been clear throughout the book of Revelation. God's purposes and God's words are going to be fulfilled. But you might notice the picture of what happens. The, the woman... Who I think for our purposes, let's not even talk about Babylon and girl. Let's talk about just the world. Let's talk about uh, uh, how the world uh, gives us this influence and pulls us away from God. We see, we see this woman who is attractive in all that it offers. So think of it in the sense of all that the world is offering to us. Uh, and, and then we see how we're called to wisdom in verse 9. Because by the time we reach verse 16, we see that while the world's ways, while her ways were initially attractive, they are, world, are ways that lead to ruin. There is a way that seems right to man that leads to destruction, isn't there? And we can think of examples. I mean, we can think of all sorts of, of things, people, addictions people create and paths they get on that leads to ruin. And, and so we might ask the question, well, what am I to do? Well, flee temptation and pursue righteousness. You can't go wrong with that instruction, can you? Flee temptation. Pursue righteousness. Learn to look at the world through God's perspective. Which neatly fits into that call for a mind of wisdom. Because, you know, persecution is easy to see, isn't it? It's easy to see when, when somebody outright attacks Christianity, when, when it's very obvious that they have a bias against followers of Christ. That's easy to identify. What's hard to identify is when we have these little things coming into our lives that are just, oh, wow, wouldn't that be nice? Oh, wow, wouldn't that be and, and, and they may not be bad things, but they start to slip into God's spot in our hearts and God's spot in our minds. And all of a sudden, we're just kind of drifting away from our faith and pursuit of something else. That's harder to identify, isn't it? Now, don't hear me wrong. Because you can enjoy good things, and God wants you to enjoy good things. But who's in the first spot? Who's in the first spot? Who's the first priority? That's really what it boils down to, isn't it? But learn to look at the world through God's perspective. You know, it's interesting. I, I was uh, um, praying this morning. Sorry about that. Uh, and, and as I was praying this morning, uh, some, some of you kind of know that our, our house has had a wonderful history of problems. Uh, you know, we, we like the place, but we've had you know, like two pipes that have burst. We've had floors that had to have replaced. We've had mold. We've had, actually, we've had lots of plumbing issues besides two pipes that burst. We've had floor drains that have plumbed. The house has had a number of things that have happened over the time. And, and, and you know, uh, in fact, we were talking about yesterday, and Amanda's like, you know, I just... It, it's a nice house, and we like the house and all, but there's been just a number of things. I'm like, man, it's been one thing after. Even after we had it inspected, right? It's been one thing after another. Uh, and and uh, so I, I'm down praying this morning, and you know, uh, I don't know where it came from, but it's really impressed upon my heart. I thought, the truth is, when we had that first big thing, the mold problem with the house, uh, 
We hadn't known turbines for too long at that point. I don't remember how long, and they came and they helped, and we pretty much did life together for the next, what, month and a half? How long did that take us? Month and a half, two months? Two months. We did life together for the next month and a half, two months. And, and, and it just dawned on me. I'm like, you know, the friendship that we have developed with turbines happened because we had mold in the basement. <laughs> I'm moldy. Yeah, I mean, look at his shirt. I mean, really. <laughs> but, but I thought, you know, if we hadn't had that problem with the house and subsequent problems, you know, I think the friendship would have been there, but I don't think it would have developed the same way they did. And, and, and it just really was laid on my heart. But I thought, you know, it was really a blessing. That's not the world's perspective. Well, I have mold in my basement. That's a blessing. But when it dawned on me this morning, I thought, you know, it really was a blessing. But that's God's perspective. That's looking at things a little bit differently. And you see, as people of faith, we shouldn't be wandering through life wondering, what am I here after? Because that's what a lot of us feel. What am I here after? Am I after the sports, or the motorcycles, or the health craze, or the fads, or, you know, what am I here after? That shouldn't be what we're wandering through life wondering, jumping from one thing to the next. We should have a clear sense of the hereafter, knowing what our calling is, knowing where true joy is, which is in God and not in the world, knowing that we need to be encouraged and we need to be strengthened to faithfully follow because you notice that the lamb has victory, but who has victory with the lamb? What verse was that? Verse uh, 14. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. And really what it boils down to is are we simply devoted to Christ? What it boils down to is our love for Christ must exceed our love for the world or we will perpetually be distracted. We will be distracted if our love for the world exceeds our love for Christ. That's not to say we won't show up to church and we won't do some of the Christian things and we won't do some studies here and there, but we will be distracted from being who God has called us to be and doing what God has called us to do if our love for Him doesn't exceed our love for the world. So here's what I want to leave you with. Hey, we're doing a little bit better today, right? On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being simply distracted, 10 being simply devoted, where do you fall? Where do you fall? And where would you like to be? You know, if I'm a 1, do I want to be a 5? If I'm a 5, do I want to be a 9? You know? Or 10, that's the language I like, right? I'm giving a little bit of grace here. Where am I? Where do I want to be? And if I'm not where I want to be, what's my plan to take the next step? What's my plan to move up the scale? Just simply being devoted to Christ. Amen. We'll give you a, a moment to fill out your communication cards and your bulletin.